témoins n'ont pas donné de raison particulière pour laquelle the le prosecuteurs aussi ne pouvaient pas donner any example of people being killed non pas as a result of being Buddhist. de personnes exécutées en raison du None fait qu'ils étaient, qu étaient bouddhistes. Presented by the co prosecutors establishes beyond reasonable doubt that Buddhists were killed que les bouddhistes ont été exécutés most importantly They contained no information linking the religion encore, of the victims with their alleged killing. Aucune information reliant la religion des victimes à leur supposée exécution. I will now turn to the alleged destruction of pagodas Je vais passer or their use for non-religious purposes ou leur utilisation à des fins regarding the alleged destruction of pagodas. Pagodas, first of all, evidence shows that many pagodas had already been destroyed or damaged during the civil war or by U.S. bombings. Secondly, the limited evidence fails to establish a systematic pattern. Finally, there is evidence that in Phnom Penh, pagodas were kept intact enfin, and that a number of official events Penh, which DK officers intact, attended were held at the pagodas or involved participation of monks. Regarding the Dans use of pagodas for non-religious purposes, this was justified by the specific circumstances the DK was under at the time. Ceci se justifiait par les circonstances As particulières we already discussed last dans lesquelles week, se trouvait le Cambodge démocratique à l'époque. DK was a country that had just come out of a civil war un pays qui juste and de years la civile, of American bombings et des années de bombardement par les Américains. De nombreux bâtiments publics avaient été détruits. There were limited public spaces available to store Il y avait très peu d'espace public grains, disponible all used as pour a police station. entreposer du riz, des céréales Under these conditions, the use of pagodas was based on practical considerations rather than being done with the intent to persecute Buddhists. I am now coming to the last section of my presentation, that is the question of religious rituals. When looked at as a whole, the evidence shows that what people were able or not able to do varied greatly depending on their location. For instance, Pechim, Trump's former district secretary, testified that people could freely practice Buddhist rituals in Trump Vulnerable M. also testified that he supervised a number of Buddhist rituals under the DK. The fact that individuals have provided evidence that they could not practice their religious freely à l'effet d'établir qu'ils ne pouvaient pas pratiquer librement leur religion this happened because of an official policy ne démontre pas que ceci découlait d'une politique officielle en particulier non pas d'une politique visant à persécuter les bouddhistes leur capacité restreinte à pratiquer certains rites à pratiquer certains rites était dû au fait que le Cambodge démocratique était en guerre avec le Vietnam et avait des ressources limitées. Furthermore, any restriction applied 
de to plus, all the UK citizens, toute restriction s'appliquait à tous les citoyens du Cambodge démocratique, indépendamment de leur religion, in any event, en toute étape de cause. Restricting people's ability to undertake certain religious rituals Restreindre la capacité does not amount des individus to the crime of religious à pratiquer certains rituels religieux n'est pas constitutif de crimes de persécution pour motifs religieux. Certain restrictions to the right of people to manifest their religion aux droits are allowed under des personnes international à manifester law. leur religion sont there is en droit therefore no evidence, no violations of a fundamental right violation which international law requires for a finding of the crime of religious persecution. Par le droit As such, pour que no conviction of Nunji is possible. Quant à la commission this de concludes de my presentation, uh, Mr. President, at this point in time. And I will now leave the floor to Aucune my international colleague, the region, who will discuss the treatment of former Khmer Republic soldiers and officers. Thank you. Et je vais passer la parole à ma consoeur, Doreen Chen, yes, qui parlera proceed. du traitement des anciens fonctionnaires et soldats de la République Khmer. Le Président, Maître, vous avez Thank la you parole. and good morning, Mr. President, Your Honours, parties and members of the public. Merci, Monsieur le Président. The fourth and final alleged targeted group in our trial is former Khmer Republic, that is, former Lon Nol soldiers and officials. And in this session, I'll be addressing the co-prosecutor's argument that this group were victims of political persecution that were ultimately systematically executed. Mr. President, you will recall that this question was extensively discussed in case 002-01. You'll also recall that the Supreme Court Chamber, in fact, acquitted Nunchia of all charges in this regard. That chamber concluded that there was no evidence of a policy contemplating the execution of former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials between April and May 1975. Well, the exact same reasoning applies here. The co-prosecutor's position is mostly based on anonymous and uncorroborated hearsay, on out-of-court evidence and on unauthenticated documents. They strangely also still rely heavily on the very same evidence they presented in case 002-01, despite the fact that the Supreme Court Chamber found it to be insufficient. On a separate issue, it's also worth us noting from the outset that our team was forced to operate in the dark regarding charges on former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. As detailed in our brief, the scope of the charges was never clearly defined, so it's impossible, in fact, for us to know the case we have to answer. Nevertheless, here and in our brief, we do address the evidence that the co-prosecutors presented. And what you'll see, as I'll discuss in the first part of my presentation, is that they rely on such weak evidence for a very simple reason. There was never a CPK policy to target former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. In the second part of my presentation, you'll see that even when looking at the factual allegations on the ground, nothing proves that in practice, former soldiers or officials of the Khmer Republic were systematically persecuted or executed due to their political opinions. Now, turning to the first issue of policy, what the co-prosecutors claim is that the CPK had a policy to target officers and senior civil servants from the Khmer Republic and to execute them. Similarly, so-called ordinary Khmer Republic soldiers were allegedly, and I quote, viewed with suspicion that often led to execution. 
les Unquote. soldats de la République Khmer, les soldats ordinaires, Unsurprisingly, however, the co failed to back this avec suspicion with any ce qui a conduit à leur exécution. Comment pouvait s'y attendre tout First, les co-procureurs the co-prosecutors argue that in April and May 1975, CPK leaders, including Moon Chia, quote, disseminated orders to remove or eliminate high-ranking Khmer Republic soldiers and officials, unquote. Now, this claim mostly relies on the testimony of one M. Un, who was a civil party who testified in case 002-01, not in this trial, and who had been a doctor working in the East Zone. Once again, however, Mr. President, the co-prosecutors misrepresent the evidence. What M. Un in fact said was that Nun Chia talked about, and I quote, finding individuals who burrow within the party. Unquote. M. Un did not hear Nun Chia talking about former members of the Khmer Republic regime. Rather, his, his evidence is that it was his I'm sorry. His impression that Nun Chia talked about them. Mr. President, Your Honours, I don't need to tell you this, obviously. Someone's impressions are not proof beyond reasonable doubt. And when you review the sources quoted in the co-prosecutor's brief, in addition to M. Un, they also rely on S21 chief Doik and the alleged photographer Nem N to argue the existence of a nationwide policy. However, as we've argued extensively in our brief and we'll discuss this afternoon, those are some of the least credible witnesses in this entire trial. And then the other sources that the co-prosecutors use are written records of interviews of people who did not testify, their DC CAN statements, their books of academics, newspaper articles, and even S21 statements. The co-prosecutors even go so far as to rely on second-hand hearsay allegedly attributed to the late Yen Sari. The co-prosecutors also heavily rely on unauthenticated lists of people who were allegedly arrested. And these lists are the so-called Tramcock district records, as well as S21 lists. What the prosecutors argue is that the mere fact that former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials are listed shows a targeting policy. However, as we discussed last week, the Tramcock district records have no probative value whatsoever. Neither do S21 lists, as my colleague Victor Coppe will discuss later today. And even if we were to consider these kinds of documents as reliable, the mere fact that someone's former job is listed does not mean that he or she was arrested on that basis. So to take an example, if I were arrested by the police, my current profession would be listed on the official paperwork. This would not mean, however, that I was necessarily arrested because I'm a lawyer at the ECCC. And again, Your Honours, quantity of evidence is not proof beyond reasonable doubt, as the Supreme Court chamber has unequivocally held. Moreover, the reality is that the co-prosecutors are unable to present any official CPK document calling for the persecution or execution of former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. And why? Because there was never any such policy. And then in an attempt to cover up the lack of credible and objectively reliable evidence, the co-prosecutors argue that any reference to so-called enemies in the official CPK documents includes members of the former regime. However, this, as explained last week by my colleague Liv Sovanez, is pure speculation, not backed by evidence. And to, rem yes, Mr. President, to remind you of what my colleague Liv Savannah said, enemies were people who conducted activities against national security. 
Their former jobs did not matter. Their political views did not matter. Their religion did not matter. What mattered were their actions. No more and no less. Second, the co-prosecutors fail to provide any link, any evidence linking Nunchia with the alleged persecution or killing of former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. All the evidence that they do refer to in this regard is either misrepresentative or inconclusive. And I'll give you an example. Please take a look at paragraph 318 of the co-prosecutor's brief. The co-prosecutors argue that Nun Chia instructed cadres to identify and smash the enemy. They further argue that when referring to the so-called enemy, Nun Chia was specifically referring to those who had served the Khmer Republic regime. However, None of the evidence cited in support of this allegation actually shows that Nun Chia identified former Khmer Republic soldiers or officials as enemies. The co-prosecutors further refer to Nun Chia's knowledge that seven so-called Long Nol super traders were called for and then executed. They also allege that he, quote, admitted, unquote, to Tet Sambat that the top leadership of the Khmer Republic regime was, quote, liquidated, unquote. However, once again, Mr. President and Your Honours, Evidence must be seen in context. What Nun Chia actually said to Tet Sambat when asked about any orders regarding former Khmer Republic soldiers and top officials after the 17th of April 1975 was that, and I quote him here, as I recall, defeated soldiers were to surrender their weapons and return home, unquote. Nun Chia also explicitly said to Tet Samba that he was not aware of the killings of former soldiers. He even added that, quote, if I had known then, we would have taken preventive measures to stop that kind of killing, because they'd done nothing wrong. They were normal soldiers, unquote. Your Honours, the principle is clear. If the co-prosecutors are relying on what is said in this video, then they must also accept the exculpatory aspects of it. They can't just cherry-pick. Ultimately, moreover, this is the extent of the co-prosecutors' attempts to link Nunchia with an official policy to persecute and execute former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. There is nothing here permitting a finding of guilt beyond reasonable doubt. Further on the question of policy, Four former DK cadres from three different zones categorically denied, they categorically denied the existence of a persecution and execution policy. The first two of these were from the southwest zone. We had Pek Chim, the former Tramcock district chief. We also had, secondly, Sao Van, who had been a commune committee member in various locations during the DK. The co-prosecutors focus on Salvan. They argue that Salvan's evidence is not credible due to, and I quote, fundamental inconsistencies and his inclination to minimize his knowledge of crimes. Unquote. Mr. President, I think you'll note that this is not the same standard that the co-prosecutors apply for individuals who appeared on their behalf. Many of their witnesses would not have any credibility under this standard, especially their star witness, Doik. In any event, the co-prosecutors fail to substantiate their position. As we've explained extensively in our brief, Salvan is a credible witness, and this was moreover confirmed by the Supreme Court Chamber. That chamber, as you'll recall, relied on Salvan's evidence. 
among others, to acquit Nunchi of the charges related to the treatment of former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. Now, the third former cadre who testified to the treatment of former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials is Prakyu, the former secretary of Kampong Siem district in Sector 41 of the Central Zone. And her evidence fully summarizes the CPK's approach. What she said was that at a 1977 meeting, the sector secretary, Ta'an, reportedly said the following, and I'll quote her. He instructed to identify former Lon Non soldiers, soldiers who were considered not good. And for those who were good, they were spared. Prakut added, those who were good could live peacefully. Fourthly and finally, the former Northwest Zone cadre, Li Nook, confirmed that no specific policy applied to former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. He explained that soldiers and officials from previous regimes could live peacefully unquote, in his area. And this evidence from these high-level cadres is corroborated by many others, as detailed at length in our brief. As a last note on policy, the evidence shows that some members of the former regime, in fact, held leadership positions during the DK. For example, in cooperatives like Kampong Leng or Pongyang Lu, and in the military. Your Honours, I think it's quite clear. This is hardly consistent with the existence of a policy aiming to target, persecute and execute them all. What the evidence instead mm -hmm. illustrates Les is the legitimate, official CPK national defence and security policy. De de as long as individuals were not found guilty of activities threatening state security, they were trusted and assimilated, regardless of their background. Now, not only is there no credible evidence that former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials were systematically identified in an effort to later target them, there's also no evidence that they were systematically killed, and even less so as a result of their political beliefs. When we look at the factual allegations on the alleged implementation of a policy in practice, the theme is the same. The co-prosecutors fail to present credible and reliable evidence. Mr. President, Your Honours, I ask you, please review the documents cited in the co-prosecutors' brief. You will see that they are mostly untested written records of interview, out-of-court statements, or documents taken out of context. You'll also see that in fact, there is no evidence that people were systematically targeted or later killed because they were associated with the former Khmer Republic. When one looks closely, what one sees is that the evidence cited by the co-prosecutors only shows that people who happen to have been associated with the former regime were targeted. What it does not establish is the reason for their arrest or execution. Indeed, in most cases, no details are provided as to the reasons for the arrest of the individuals. And where such detail is available, what we in fact see is that only some former Khmer Republic soldiers or officials were concerned. Those who were engaged in activities threatening the regime. I'll give you an example here. A September 1976 telegram cited by the co-prosecutors, its document E3-813, this telegram in fact refers to soldiers engaged in, and I quote, no good movements, unquote. Prakut also confirmed the distinction between regular people and people engaged in enemy activity. 
qu'il y avait entre les, la population et la population, ce n'est pas des Trump-Cock district une records. One of them, on pouvait se fonder which is a 9th April 1977 report, that's numbered E3-4103. That report asks for guidance about what to do with, and I quote, those who hold a ranking position and soldiers, unquote. Now, had there been a policy to destroy them, would there even be a need to ask for such guidance? Mr. President, the reality is that any measure taken which may have affected individuals associated with the Khmer Republic were legitimate measures resulting from the CPK's national defense and security policy, as we discussed last week. Like in many countries worldwide today, people were arrested because of their own criminal actions, not because of their former positions or political views. And furthermore, while there might have been some isolated examples of people targeted on the basis of their association with the Khmer Republic, these actions were the result of local authorities acting autonomously. They were deviations from the official policy as we detail in our brief. And there is no link between these crimes and Nun Chia or the CPK. Finally, enfin, very much like in case 002-01, the co-prosecutors fail to establish beyond reasonable doubt that former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials were systematically killed due to their political views or membership of the former regime. The co-prosecutors use only anecdotal and unsubstantiated evidence in this regard. But this this fails to demonstrate beyond reasonable doubt again that the killings were due to their specific background. And to give you just one example, at paragraph 326 of their brief, the co-prosecutors state that, and I quote, Commune Chief Tacham called on all residents to a meeting and publicly bludgeoned a man and his son to death on allegations of non-null connections and possessing a weapon. Unquote. Your Honours, this statement is simply factually incorrect. In fact, you just need to look at the quotes in the co-prosecutor's own footnote. Prom Sarun said that the person was, and I quote, perhaps perhaps a lone lone soldier, peut -être, peut -être unquote. Un soldat lone lone. Fin de what was sure, however, is that this person had quoi? hidden a gun. And I quote, for, that, cite, reason, for raison, that reason, for that reason, he was smashed, unquote. Elle a été Mr. Citation. President, how does this constitute evidence of killing a person question, associated with the former regime? It just doesn't. Ultimately, and very much like the allegations on the treatment of the Cham, the Vietnamese, and the Buddhists, there is simply no credible evidence to support the co-prosecutor's case on former Khmer Republic soldiers and officials. Now, Your Honours, this concludes our presentation regarding the treatment of targeted Monsieur groups. President, and in the time I have remaining, I'll now begin to present the CPK's policy on cooperatives and work sites. Cooperatives and work sites are foundational to communist ideology. They're textbook examples Ce sont of how a collectivized communist economy is created. As such, they were established conséquent, throughout the decade as part of the CPK's socialist place. revolution. Durant and because of how widespread they were, they're central to many Cambodians' DK experience. They've become central to the Manichaean narrative. And because of that, of course, they've become central to the co-prosecutor's case. Now, these days, collectivization can seem unusual. It differs dramatically from what is practiced in so-called Western liberal democracies. 
dans ce qu'il est convenu d'appeler les démocraties However, libérales occidentales. Toutefois, we, we nous ne pouvons pas appréhender kind of les choses hors du contexte historique. Back in 1975, en 1975, we were at the height of the Cold War, and economic and social collectivization was a widespread global phenomenon. Plus important, Western liberal As tempting as it may be to some to use this as an occasion to put communism on trial, ce tribunal this pour faire le procès totally du communisme, ceci est well tout à fait déplacé et ne correspond nullement au mandat du tribunal. To put it simply, pour dire les choses simplement, the differences between ideologies and their approaches to governance are legally irrelevant here. Sont What is